Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, my name is Jake Harrington, and I'm an intelligence fellow here in the International Security Program. I'm so excited today to welcome this incredibly distinguished panel for a discussion on the future of the US-UK Intelligence Alliance. Over the past month, we've seen the US, the United Kingdom, NATO, European, and global allies unify to confront Russia's aggression against Ukraine and its people. And amidst this tragedy, the one thing that's been abundantly clear is that alliances still matter. They're essential to success in confronting Russia and Ukraine, and they will be key to our joint success in the years to come. So it's against this backdrop that CSIS is releasing a new report today. Uh, and those of you who are streaming online, the report uh, should be available on the page uh, as of now, uh, that I co-wrote with my colleague, Riley McCabe, entitled The Case for Cooperation, The Future of the US-UK Intelligence Alliance. It's a report that's been nearly a, uh, nearly a year in the making, supported by dozens of interviewees and experts who informed our findings and recommendations. And it wouldn't have been possible without the partnership of the Royal United Services Institute, RUSI, in the United Kingdom, particularly James Sullivan and Artie Janjeva, as well as the entire team at Rebellion Defense who supported this work. Um, and so before I turn to this great panel to do most of the talking today, I wanted to share a bit about our new report. Uh, those of you who keep up with the rare, but increasingly less rare, of public appearances by intelligence chiefs may have taken notice of remarks that Richard Moore, the chief of MI6, gave in London last year. In those remarks, he addressed the challenges of intelligence in the digital age, and he said something I think is really profound for those of us who think about the future of the intelligence mission. He said, to remain secret, we're going to have to become more open. Now, what do you mean by this? Uh, certainly, it appears that he meant being more open with the public. We've seen that with the unprecedented volume of intelligence declassifications prior to and during Russia's war in Ukraine. The British Ministry of Defense is releasing intelligence updates daily on Twitter. It also means being more open with the private sector. Uh, as Chief Moore noted, intelligence agencies cannot and should not compete with the private sector in the pursuit of emerging technology. To, they have to be a partner. And third, it means working closely with allies to jointly confront a threat environment that's increasingly complex, ambiguous, and overloaded with data, information, and disinformation. And on both sides of the Atlantic, strategies like the Integrated Review, agreements like the New Atlantic Charter and AUKUS reflect the extent to which both Washington and London view the alliance as critical to future mutual security. And so if all this is so clear, if our commitments are, so, uh, are shared at the highest levels across both governments, what could be the issue? So, well, through our research, as we looked at these statements about the alliance and its importance and compared them to the array of policies and procedures that actually govern the day-to-day -day activities of the alliance, we found that to achieve the, the vision of deep cooperation that's reflected in documents in both Washington and London, we need to modernize how we share information and how we share technology. The unifying vision for the recommendations in our report was to make it easier for the US and the UK intelligence services to match words with actions when they both mutually decided it's in their best interest to do so. They are also intended to make it possible for the Alliance to sustain its historic successes in an era where the threat environment is rapidly evolving, decision windows are short, and data is overwhelming every agency and analyst. To build toward an Alliance that's best postured to meet these threats, we propose six recommendations across three pillars. The first pillar is modernizing information sharing policies for the digital age, focusing on ensuring that these policies can support information sharing at the speed and scale demanded by current and future threats. The second pillar focuses on promoting joint technology development and technology sharing, including building intelligence-specific joint analytic capabilities and streamlining the ways we partner in the pursuit of emerging and disruptive technologies that are at the heart of strategic technology competition with countries like China and Russia. And the third pillar encourages evaluating technologies that could introduce new ways of working together, including development of privacy-enhancing technologies and other so-called democracy-affirming technologies. Finally, the report includes a section on the role of the special relationship in advancing a joint vision of intelligence in a free society. We've seen intelligence leaders on both sides of the Atlantic increasingly <clears throat> making public statements, calling out the malign activities of our competitors, and advancing a competing vision for how intelligence can and should function in a free and open society. 
Building on these nascent efforts, leaders on both sides of the Atlantic should work together to advance a clear, unified vision for how intelligence can be detected in a way, conducted in a way that advances rather than undermines civil liberties, human rights, and our core shared values. Although confronting ascendant authoritarianism and shedding light on the ways that technology enables these states to weaponize data against their own citizens is not exclusively a challenge for intelligence leaders, their organizations do have a key role to play in building trust and highlighting how their values and their activities differ from those of China, Russia, and other autocratic states. And so with that, I wanna introduce this fantastic panel, and I'll introduce all three uh, that we have, and then we'll go across the table for each of them to make some opening remarks. Um, as we had discussed, Ed Ferguson from the British Embassy was going to join us today, but as much as we are all over COVID, uh, COVID is not over with us. So uh, unfortunately, Ed will not be joining us today, but we've got a fantastic group here um, of experts. Um, and so first, I'm pleased to welcome Carrie Bingen, Kerry currently serves as the Chief Strategy Officer at Hawkeye 360. She previously served as the Principal Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. And prior to that appointment was the Policy Director on the House Armed Services Committee. She's also a non-resident senior associate here at CSIS. Next, we have Samantha Clark. Samantha currently serves as General Counsel at Rebellion Defense, and she previously served in a number of senior staff positions on the Senate Armed Services Committee, including as Deputy Staff Director and General Counsel for Chairman John McCain. And we have uh, James Denoy. Jim uh, currently serves as an adjunct faculty member at George Mason University, and he's a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He's a retired career intelligence officer from the Defense Intelligence Agency and he served in numerous senior roles across the U.S. intelligence community, including as President Barack Obama's PDB briefer and as the National Intelligence Manager for Europe and NATO. Thank you guys so much for being here today. And Carrie, I will ask you to make the first remarks. Sure, sure. So, you know, I, 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 as I was thinking about today's event, it, it gave me an opportunity to reflect back um, on my time both uh, in the Pentagon as well as Congress and, and how we viewed the relationship between the U.S. and the U.K. And, you know, I, what first comes to mind is how fortunate I was to really see the best of the relationship. Um, I mean, I'll tell you, there were, we cooperated, we, we worked together on some of the most sensitive things, uh, whether it ranged from uh, the National Security Agency, NSA, which you know, marked the 75th anniversary of cooperation last year, to sensitive operations, uh, placement and access and collection, things I can't talk about, but I would share, I mean, they were pretty pretty phenomenal. Um, seeing coalition operations, having a chance when I was in Congress to, to take members out to Iraq, Afghanistan, elsewhere around the world, and seeing Brits and Americans side by side in the uh, tactical operations centers and, and out in the field. Um, seeing de uh, defense intelligence liaisons uh, embedded here at the Pentagon or at, at MOD at Whitehall. Um, the strategic assessments that were done jointly. Um, and I was actually just out at a Paycom last week and, and one of the vices there is, is a Brit. And so seeing that that day-to-day -day, uh, activity happen is pretty, pretty tremendous. And then when I was in um, the Intelligence and Security Office over in the Pentagon, we had a UK liaison. We actually had uh, five I liaisons. Um, we had some, uh, some great forums for defense intelligence cooperation, some discus dome plate for the civilians and the military defense intelligence leaders. They were constantly being evolved to best serve, um, serve uh, all, all of the participants. And maybe a, a, a sign of, I think, how good things were is um, our UK liaison was brought into all of our staff meetings, our weekly staff meetings. I don't know if he wanted to be there or not, but, but we brought him into the tempo there. Um, and it's been very good to see um, similar themes, whether it's in the National Defense Strategy or the British Integrated Defense Review, um, where you have a very much a convergence on a th the threat outlook with China, Russia, strategic competition, um, the challenge of operating in a contested environment with space and cyber, uh, increasingly contested domains, the rapid technological change, uh, concern about the Chinese toolkit uh, to acquire foreign technology and, and how to counter it, um, the importance of collective action amongst our, our, our allies and partners. So I think you're seeing great alignment there. But then I also remembered there were hard things. And, um, the, 
as much as we were able to do the exquisite together, it was some, it was the hard things that really should have been the basic easy things to do that were oftentimes some big barriers to, to true collaboration and integration. Things like physical access, just to get a skiff up and running in the Pentagon for, for the five eyes together took upwards of five years just cutting through the bureaucratic red tape, getting exceptions to policy, work in agreements and paperwork packages. It shouldn't take that long. Getting badging, getting access to just address books on, on, on online, um, things like that that help um, better, you know, help us better uh, truly collaborate um, were barriers and, and they shouldn't be. Um, you know, as I look forward, um, you know, I think we'll need to take a hard look at um, those intelligence sharing policies you said, but particularly in light of the um, technology trends that we're seeing with the amount of data sources out there, unclassified as well as classified, um, what machine learning and automation is bringing. We will need to get to a point where we are able to operate machine to machine at machine speeds where data is talking to data or data is interacting with data. Um, and as, as, as wonderful as our foreign disclosure officers are, is you can't have a human in a loop in those processes. You've got to be able to be timely and relevant and fast. Um, and I think uh, uh, a lot of that will start with that hard we look at policy you know, process and frameworks. And I look forward to There's a lot more here to talk yeah. about that we'll unpack, but I'll stop there. Much to discuss. Yeah. Samantha. Thank you. Um, just in listening to the opening comments and talking about we need to modernize sharing information. We need to modernize sharing technology. So when I was working with Senator McCain, one of the things he was really interested in was expanding the national technology industrial base. And for those, um, I'm sure this audience is very well versed, so you probably are aware, but just in case anyone's not, the national technology industrial base includes the US, Canada, UK, and Australia. And the whole point is to improve collaboration between the different countries, sort of primary industrial bases focused a lot in the defense sector and the technology sector and a lot of what the DODs and MODs need. Um, originally, it was designed to just be a US-Canada agreement and a lot was done to implement under that agreement. The relationship was very strong and Senator McCain always felt like the UK and Australia were also really important partners and allies in that they should be brought under the fold there. So as part of that, we did our fact finding. So we had several conversations with partners in the UK and Australia. We went and visited them. They passed our clearances and we were able to sit in a, a windowless room and learn about what they were working on and what their pain points were. And we heard over and over and over again about the barriers to collaboration, the barriers to trade, the ITAR taint, the inability to uh, inability to be able to collaborate between engineers and just have simple technical conversations um, either through real or perceived blockages based on the way that the laws had been written. And this sort of, I think the general consensus was that we don't trust by default. We sort of verify, we decide if we can trust and the barriers are really high. And so. How do you go about solving that? Well, Senator McCain felt that if we expanded the national technology industrial base, that then the conversations and the collaboration would follow to implement those relationships and to implement the UK and Australia as sort of full members of this group that previously just included the US and Canada. And this was six years ago that we did this. So um, looking where it's at today is a little disappointing because not much has happened. I think there was an effort when Ellen Lord was undersecretary um, for acquisition and sustainment to sort of revitalize some of those conversations, but there are always other world events and things that get in the way. There was a, the big dispute about Huawei and, and technology and what those countries were going to use that sort of paused some of the conversations, especially with the UK for a while during the Trump administration. And I'm really hoping that with AUKUS coming online, that sort of gives us a mechanism to reinvigorate these discussions around the <coughs> national technology industrial base and actually getting it implemented. Because when I look at AUKUS, I see a lot of great things, right? I see that collaboration on nuclear powered submarines and something that 
the U.S. and the U.K. previously, you know, these were the crown jewels, we're not going to share them, and, and now we're sort of saying, well, there might be some instances where we would, and why wouldn't we trust one of our closest allies with this, and let's have those conversations. And then we say, well, we also want to share and collaborate on cyber and quantum and AI, three keystone technology areas. But there really wasn't a mechanism for that, right? There's an agreement to start discussions at some point, hasn't quite started yet, but how do we actually do that? Because a lot of the restrictions that have prevented collaboration elsewhere are still there today. So do we also look at the NTIB implementation as a means of setting up some collaboration or you know, free trade zones of sort where you could collaborate on certain things, especially at the unclassified level? Do we look at you know, the, the FOCI process and what that means for companies working in this area? Do we look at the mismatch in our laws on how CFIUS treats something versus how DCSA treats something? You, know, you have Treasury, State, and DOD all doing slightly different things in this area and treating the different countries slightly differently based on different standards. There's not a lot of collaboration there. There are a lot of things we could look at here um, to move this forward, but I was just very glad to see that recommendation on sharing technology and doing so at the speed of relevance because if you don't have these processes in place, then you're stuck in this old system of licenses and taking six years to get a room for people to talk in. And I, I really hope we're past that point now or that at least AUKUS gives me some hope that we're moving past that point and that leadership wants to. But lots more to discuss and thanks for having this today. Thanks, Samantha. Jim. Well, first of all, thank you, Jake, and thank CSIS for, for having this event. It's an extremely important topic, UK-US intelligence cooperation. And uh, I'm honored to share the, the stage with Kerry and Samantha in this regard. You can't have a discussion about US, UK, anything without having a Churchill quote. So I pulled one out of the dustbin uh, just for this occasion. Yeah. It's April 1st, 1945. The war in Europe is coming to a climax against Nazi Germany. And what does Churchill say after five, almost six years of war with Britain, uh, uh, with Britain at the forefront? There is only one thing worse than fighting a war with allies, and that is fighting a war without allies. So this is where we go to, to build on Kerry and, and Samantha's uh, comments. First of all, the cooperation starts with political will. Without political will, no relationship, be it intelligence or defense or any relationship, is, is going to move uh, any further. We certainly have that in the case of the U.S. and the U.K. The U.K.-U.S. intelligence relationship has really uh, 75 years, almost 80 years uh, in, in the making. It has served as the nucleus for all of our uh, cooperation uh, between the U.S. intelligence community and, and other partners, uh, be it the, the Five Eyes, the so-called Five Eyes, which is Canada, uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, the U.S. and the U.K., and also our intelligence cooperation uh, with NATO. So you look at the U.S.-U.K., the oldest, really deepest intelligence relationship we have with any country, uh, and that serves as the nucleus and the foundation to, to move forward. So Samantha and, and Kerry talked about uh, collaboration, and to me, uh, I'm an analyst by trade, so I spent 38 years in the intelligence community as, as an analyst, and so I, I try to, and I'm a simple person, so I kind of look for simple constructs to, to sort of attack this problem. So I look at it, uh, there's several levels of cooperation, if, if, if you would. There's the uh, coordination part, that is, okay, we're just gonna kind of talk to each other and, and uh, maybe tell each other what we're, we're about to do. And then there's the collaboration, and that is the working together, actually uh, sharing even more information and working shoulder to shoulder. And then there's the integration uh, level of cooperation. And I think with, with the relationship we have with the UK, uh, certainly deep in the area of collaboration, we really need to move to what I would say is the highest form of cooperation, and that is integration. And as Jake had, had mentioned, I served in the Office of Director of National Intelligence as a National Intelligence Manager, a NIM, uh, for Europe and NATO. And the primary function of a NIM is to integrate the intelligence community's efforts across the board, all 18 intelligence entities in the U.S. intelligence community, 
in whatever area uh, is your resp responsibility, be it a geographic area of responsibility or a functional. And again, mine was Europe and NATO. So it's that integration part. How do we take the relationship that we've had for so many years with the UK uh, to the next level? And are, the, are British uh, compadres uh, willing to do that with us? So how do you move from collaboration to really full integration? I break it down uh, under three uh, lines of effort, and I owe these three lines of effort to a former boss of mine, I believe Kerry knows him, John Bansomer, Lieutenant General John Bansomer, who I worked for at U.S. European Command, and was also, he happened to be the head of partnership engagement at the Office of Director of National Intelligence. And he kind of took this approach, he called it the three Ps, policies, processes, and people. All of them are important. And if you read the CSIS report, it does really hit on the policies that need to be changed and the processes. Then I would add, you know, we got to look at the people factor as well. So what, am I, what are we talking about in terms of policies? The disclosure policies, if you read the report, it talks about changing Intelligence Community Directive 403, which lays out uh, the policies for intelligence sharing. But then we also have the national disclosure policy uh, out there, which really needs to be changed. Before we, we gathered on this stage, we were talking in the back room about, you know, uh, I used to work real hard being in the Defense Department as a, a DIA intelligence officer, Defense Intelligence Agency officer, on the national disclosure policy dash one, which, which uh, drove all of the intel sharing. And for, in order for us to get anything done, what did we have to do? We had to go back and get an exception to the national disclosure policy. And as I told Carrie and Samantha and Jake, you know, if you find yourself having to get an exception to policy in order to do anything that you want to get done, what does that tell you? It needs, the policy needs to be changed. It needs to be amended. And so ND, NDP1, uh, along with ICD403, all of those overarching intelligence sharing policies need to be overhauled in order to be relevant in today's world. Processes, and we'll talk more about this uh, in the remaining time we have. But for me, the processes involved in intelligence sharing and intelligence cooperation uh, across the gamut from common tradecraft, intelligence tradecraft, be that collection uh, tradecraft, analytic tradecraft, what about joint training? Uh, you need the intelligence technology backbone in order to share information on a timely uh, basis in terms of volume and, and timeliness. And then the people aspect, which I'll tell you, being a people person, I, I think really at the end of the day is the most important part of it, regardless of the technology. Uh, and, that, and that involves joint duty assignments, that involves having integrated officers uh, between the US and the UK and all of the intelligence nodes. And when I mean integrated, I mean really integrated. Uh, not just window dressing, not just sharing a little bit of information, but not really, uh, you know, the family jewels. Uh, really integrated, having them in a day-to-day -day basis as part, as if they were uh, a, a UK officer, which they were an American officer, an American as a UK officer. And then uh, finally, we may have to create new positions uh, and, get a, and do away with old legacy positions that are not serving any purpose in this new era of intelligence integration between the US and the UK. And then I'll finally leave this, uh, this question out there is, who will coordinate and integrate the overall US-UK intelligence relationship across uh, those enterprises? As we move forward and we, we do all of this, you're gonna need somebody to kind of orchestrate that. Who is that on the US side and who is, who is that on the UK side? And then finally, uh, as we move forward, uh, as I always tell people, uh, as you move forward with, with deeper intelligence cooperation with any, any partner, get yourself a good lawyer. Because lawyers, lawyers, lawyers. You got to make sure you have the proper legal framework because none of us wants to go to jail, right? Uh, either on purpose or inadvertently. So. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Jake. Thank you very much.
Thank you all so much. There's so much to discuss. So, I mean, I think, you know, and, and, you know, these themes are just, you know, all so important, you know, particularly talking about how, you know, we use exceptions in information sharing and physical access and technology sharing to do the work that we've committed ourselves to. And I think that really illuminates uh, that challenge. But I wanted to turn a little bit to current events and, and get your guys' thoughts on the role of intelligence in the Ukraine war. I mean, we've seen um, remarkable transparency from uh, both the United States and the United Kingdom in terms of sharing intelligence, combating disinformation, providing insights into events on the ground, trying to provide some ground truth. Um, but they're also operating in tandem with this massive OSINT community who are delivering real-time, remarkable insights from geospatial imagery, from social media, and from other platforms into what's going on the ground as well. And in a lot of ways, the intelligence services are sort of operating in tandem with this open source intelligence enterprise. Um, wh what are your what are your uh, your thoughts on um, you know the lessons we've learned to date, um, and is this going to be a transformational moment for the alliance? Um, as you know, as we look back at history, we know you know it's been moments of crisis that have really sort of reshaped the way we do work together. There was World War II, the Cold War, 9/11, um, and now you know we're clearly on a path to this new. Um, you know, to this, to this shared vision of the challenges around strategic competition, great power competition, and now we have this, this conventional war in Eastern Europe. Where does the relationship go from here? And I'll open up to any of you guys to take the first on that. Well, I'll, I'll jump in real quick uh, since I'm on a roll. Uh, yeah, Jake, uh, absolutely. Look, I think the, uh, the issue of publicly available information uh, what we may call open source intelligence. Now remember, the intelligence community doesn't collect intelligence. It collects information and, and data. Uh, it only becomes intelligence until it's analyzed. That's what I tell my, my graduate students in my course over George Mason. But th this whole issue of publicly available information is a game changer, in, in my opinion. It's, it, and the intelligence communities of the various nations, particularly the US and the UK and, the, and our Five Eyes partners, need to recognize that and deal with it uh, because uh, it is both a, a, a ready source of information. In the past, uh, I think the intelligence community acknowledged that maybe 20% of its analysis was based on open source and the other 80% on more exquisite uh, collection, whether it's technical means or, or human intelligence. And now you're starting to see people talk about, we need to flip that equation that 80% of the information that the intelligence community uses to, uh, to do its analysis is probably going to be in the area of open source. And so uh, that, that in itself is a game changer. But the big thing is it does also facilitate the shareability of intelligence. It makes it a lot easier to share intelligence, and this is what we're talking about at the end of the day, uh, than it would be with, uh, with more exquisite means in which you're concerned about the sources and methods. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it there and turn it over to my colleagues for any other comments. Yeah, I think this 80-20-20-80 thing you bring up is really important here because there has been a push over the years for DOD to ingest more OSINT as well and to be able to use that and, and look at it for campaign planning and, and different purposes you could imagine. Um, but part of what is challenging there is sort of the traditional means of collecting information and turning it into intelligence. And you know, they certainly take a lot of information from the intel community, but also generate a lot themselves. And I think we've seen through what's going on in Ukraine right now, uh, American industry really stepping up on this point. So a lot of companies that have access to this data are sharing it widely, and not just with the government, but with each other to figure out, you know, OK, you have a satellite feed here, and maybe we have a processing capability here, and let's work together on figuring something out and, and really showing what everybody has to mm -hmm. offer. And, and I think in a way that also will expose to the government what's out there and how important those capabilities are and what they can actually do. So it is a, a moment for that and an unfortunate moment that we're all living through. Um, but I, I do believe that it will show what industry is offering in that area. and have the government understand more what the value of OSINT is, actually knowing what's happening 
immediately and, and you know not just with satellite data but also with social media and what are people talking about and it's not in the obvious places right anyone can go on Twitter or Instagram and look for things but you know what's being talked about on VK or on Telegram or on Reddit you know deeps in the bowels of the internet where a lot of these people hang out what's going on and, and how do you figure out what's important there, what's not important, and what are the capabilities you need to sift through that and to provide the important pieces as fast as possible back to this sort of speed of relevance uh, point that we've been making at the beginning of this discussion. So I, I think we're gonna see a lot from this um, because it has to happen fast or it's not gonna be helpful. Yes, I mean, what I'd say is uh, what's happening is, is absolutely horrific and, and completely unwarranted and, and, and unnecessary um, due to, to Putin's aggression. Um, but there's a, clear, so that, so there's a clear urgency of the moment right now, um, and there is a clarity to mission and purpose. Uh, and, and what I see that, that's particularly just eye-opening and, and, and transformational in this moment is you have two things coming together here, is you have this amazing source of commercial, unclassified, shareable information, satellite imagery, radio frequency, other sources of open, open, open source intelligence that's being put out into the public domain, paired with um, the administration very consciously, deliberately releasing or disclosing uh, intelligence information. And it's those two pieces coming together that are creating great transparency. You know, I, I, I go back to the great John McLaughlin um, from CIA, mm -hmm. um, who's the director of analysis and, and the acting director for a while. Um, and he, he articulates, you know, the purpose of intelligence is to reduce uncertainty, you know, reduce uncertainty. And so I think what's unfolding now in reducing uncertainty is you have these, these commercial open source, um, open sources of information that are reducing uncertainty on capabilities, conventional capabilities you're seeing um, you know, these 40-mile columns of, of Russian conventional mm -hmm. forces and whatnot, paired with reducing uncertainty and in intent, with the disclosure of information on what are the potential courses of action, what pretexts might we see. Um, so so that, that transparency is, is tremendous. I think the challenge going forward for us will be, are we doing this all now just for this moment and for this clarity of purpose, or will we see this, this transparency, this sharing, this, this disclosure of, of information, and really this integration of the two, mm -hmm. will we see that institutionalized going forward into policy, into process, into training? Um, and for me, that's what I will be mm -hmm. looking, looking for as we go, go ahead. A follow-up question, I mean, and this isn't entirely related to the alliance, but I think it's really relevant for, for what we're, you know, discussing right now. But, you know, obviously there are so many things about the last three weeks that have been unprecedented, right? Not just the, de not just the disclosures, um, but again, the, the level of insight that's being generated from high fidelity open source intelligence. But then we're also seeing how disinformation gets overlaid with all of this, either both state-based disinformation um, as well as non-state actor and disinformation and how misinformation can 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 balloon from there. What is the role? What, what do you is this is this sort of a, is this going to be a one-off case that we see the way that this war is playing out in the social media space and the open source space in the way that uh, intelligence agencies are able to navigate that, or is it going to fundamentally transform some of their responsibilities going forward as they seek to manage one, the OSINT environment, two, the disinformation environment. What are the implications for that longer term? And what does that potentially have for implications for the way that we work together jointly to sort of navigate this more open world? Well, I think what, what, what Kerry said is absolutely true. We need to um, take this situation in terms of what we've seen with the, the run up to Russia's full up uh, invasion of of Ukraine uh, and then the fact that, that the intelligence community uh, and our partners were out in front uh, kind of preempting uh, what we expected the Russians to do in, ter in terms of so-called false flag operations or, and, and such. So I think, uh, let's hope, uh, this is, certainly this is the way it is. If you look at the elements of national power, uh, diplomatic, informational, military and economic, the informational uh, aspects of it uh, grow even more and more in, important. Uh, you know, there's an old saying, uh, the first casualty of war is the truth. And certainly in the case of Putin, uh, you know, I don't think he's ever put much value on the truth uh, across the board. So we have to get our message across. Uh, 
It's important. Uh, and when you're building your narrative and you're trying to get your narrative out, intelligence is at the forefront of that. And sharing intelligence uh, is, is uh, absolutely critical. It's been interesting, too, to just see things pop up organically. So obviously, there's a lot of collaboration from NATO and, and the EU and lots of countries that want to help and use their capabilities to help, but just what ordinary people are doing, right? So in Poland, they started this app where any regular person could just get on and they could email or call like thousands of Russians and try to tell them like, hey, this is what's going on. And, you know, some of them got responses like, you know, glory to Putin, go away, I don't believe you. But a lot of them did engage and said like, I'm shocked to hear this is what's happening and it's a way for ordinary people to reach out. Um, and then you have, of course, people signing up for the Ukrainian uh, IT army and, and all of these things popping up where they're saying just anybody with these skills come and help. And you know, the government's working behind the scenes to catch up with that. But, you know, to have this full scale movement of ordinary people, you know, they were interviewing people that were using this messaging service and they were saying, you know, I'm a truck driver in Oregon or I'm a mom in Panama or I'm a mom in Finland and just people, ordinary people that were seeing what was happening and wanted to help because you hear these just horrific stories of people in Ukraine calling their parents in Russia and saying like, I'm actively being bombed. And they're saying, no, no, it's your own people. Like Putin wouldn't do that. And they're like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, but they're being fed this constant diet of Kremlin propaganda and breaking into that is really hard. And it almost does take a global effort. It takes the government trying to help, but also ordinary people. And sometimes, in a situation like this, that can be more helpful because you might not believe what another government's saying, but if some regular person from Central America contacts you and is trying to tell you what they're seeing and their perspective, you might listen, you might not, but there's, there's a good chance you might. And I think just those slow little pieces chipping away, I think we'll learn a lot about this in dealing with autocratic regimes. There are certainly other countries you could think of uh, an application for should something similar happen. And so I think there will be a lot of lessons learned by this, but I hope it continues and I hope the people of Ukraine uh, are able to get the help they need from everybody. Yeah, and just building off of uh, Jim and Samantha's comments, I mean, what's striking to me are, are two areas right now, it, speed and integration. Um, on, on the integration point, and Jim mentioned this earlier, is um, I think the key is going to be how do you bring all of these different sources of information together? And you know, if you think about our analysts uh, uh, out, out at NATO, you know, they're, 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 they're using certain information networks, they're using certain platforms, they're using certain analytical tools. So for OSINT to be relevant to mm -hmm. their mission, where they're combining government data sources with open source uh, sources, how do you make sure that you're not having them look at some you know, 30 other platforms, um, but really truly bringing it together into one place integrated, that's where you're really starting to show value is integrating these open source data into networks and platforms and applications that, that, that analysts and, and that users can use. And then the second piece of this is speed. And I think what we're really seeing out of the, this open source community and, and what we're seeing really with, with um, the evolution of technology today versus 2014, 20, 20, 2008 in Georgia is just how fast um, these commercial, whether they be the space operators, the machine learning, the information technology companies, um, they're absolutely relevant because they're able to move so fast. I think that's a, 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 a marked contrast from where, we, where, where the state of the industry was just you know, eight years ago. I'm not sure if anybody's coined the phrase truth fair yet, but I guess we could consider that one for this. <laughs> but yeah, it seems you know, in, these, in these battles of narratives, that speed is, is absolutely of the essence, and that brings in all of the other components about sharing information at machine speed um, and ins ensuring decision advantage. Um, I'm getting some great questions from the online audience, but I also wanted to open the floor to the um, in-person audience. If anybody wants to go up to the microphone and ask a question, um, I'm going to use one for, that we've gotten online here. Um, and so, you know, we, we've discussed, uh, and I think, Carrie, you put it really, really nicely about, you know, what the, the war in Ukraine is doing to sort of solidify the alliance. It's a clarion call that, you know, what is right and what is wrong. Um, and the stakes that are um, that we're that we're facing um, in some of this broader uh, competitive environment, um, and some of the work that you know we've done in this report and has been you know important to note is that 
um, you know, overlaying all of this are balancing the opportunities that one can have from leveraging emerging technologies and data in support of their intelligence mission, while also doing doing so in a way that respects you know human rights, privacy, freedom of freedom of uh, freedom of speech, um, and we've certainly seen you know in in Russia how those tools have been used to suppress political opposition, um, uh, civil opposition to to the invasion. Um, as well as how uh, China has developed surveillance technologies domestically that they've used. Um, so what are your thoughts on the privacy implications of some of this data and how does um, you know, the US, UK, uh, how do the US and UK develop a stronger intelligence relationship that takes, that seizes upon the opportunities of this environment and the technologies that enable it, but also do so in a way that preserves privacy um, and is there enough commonality in, in, in values between both countries that we can come to a, a unified uh, vision on how that looks? <laughs> you want me to take, easy. Uh, you can no, take that one, Karen. I'll, I'll, I'll try and uh, please uh, jump in. Mm -hmm. um, let me start with values. Absolutely, there's no question that, that our shared values, and it's not just uh, America and Britain. I mean, I think there are many countries out there, uh, Europe, Asia, Latin America, that have the same, those same set of shared values. Um, it's also why it's so important as we figure out how to advance these emerging technologies and, and apply them, that we are equally vocal on the ethics and value discussion. Um, and I think that that is a differentiator to your point about what Russia and what China are doing to suppress and really you know, create these surveillance states, suppress minority uh, ethnic populations, et cetera. Um, you know, I do think we, do, we, we hold ourselves to an incredibly high standard and we need to be um, transparent and, and vocal about that. Um, I also would say, um, I mean, I think part of the challenge going forward here on the technology is, it. it the technology, you know, I, I say the technology is as if it's this monolithic thing, but um, we're in this big data environment. There is so much data out there um, that we are going to have to make sense of. You have some phenomenal technology companies that are creating things like um, data lakes and knowledge graphs that allow you to start you know, unleashing a machine and make connections um, between potential bad actors or uh, make connections between events that wouldn't be obvious to a human unless, you know, hours, weeks, months of effort. So you can do that now at machine speeds. Um, we will have to figure out um, how do you take a human out of the loop of that? Is, does it make sense to have a human evaluating millions upon millions of data records in a knowledge graph? It, it, it just that, that boggles my mind. You, you can't do that. You can't do it at speed, and you can't do it uh, um, to be rel to be relevant to a decision maker. So we'll have to figure out what are the policies, what are the frameworks. Of, you know, being very vocal about our clear, you know, ethical standards that w that we must apply. But how do you think? I guess maybe, I, and I don't know if this is the right analogy or not, but you know, auditing, you know, if you're being audited, it's not about looking at every single financial record. It's about making sure that you've got the right processes, procedures in place, that people are trained, that the right filters are there. So how do we maybe leverage technology to address <laughs> technology? Yeah, I think the changes in technology and, and where we've gone really help with that, right? So if you think about privacy of data in like a traditional legal sense, right? How do you think about like GDPR and CCPA when you're trying to ingest these large amounts of data? Well, automation and machine learning actually helps that because you can create algorithms that sift through, look for what's needed and delete what's not and purge the pieces you don't need and so you don't have physical eyes looking at everything. And so in a sense, like it might be going through an input, but just released on the other end, no action, no one's seen it, and the system sort of deals with that. Now you're gonna have things you have to control for on that, but there are ways to program things now where there's not an analyst sitting there for hours combing through every single posting. And so you can, you can automate privacy compliance in that way. If you wanna think about it sort of in, in the legal sense, I think, 
there's also a question here about how are we collaborating across efforts and, and using data and creating tools here. You know, so we're a US UK company. We spend a ton of time in thinking about what our company is doing to help with the Ukraine response and figuring out how can our US and UK engineering teams work together? What actually creates some type of Intel tool or something that might be export controlled where we can't work together? How do we set limits on what they do? Um, I would love to not have to do that, right? <laughs> I would love to not have to spend hours and hours making sure everyone's on the right side of those lines, which of course we will do because we take our compliance obligations very seriously. But having to limit that open collaboration of these brilliant engineers we've hired is really frustrating. I want them to be able to work together instead of on siloed projects in each country. If our goal is for all of our allies to be able to share the ultimate outcome of the new technology product or the new way of processing and identifying data trends, we need to start that with our own teams. Um, and it's frustrating to not be able to do so. And I think a lot of what's going on now is just exacerbating or highlighting some of those frustrations and where we're trying to collaborate. If I could just jump in real quick, I mean, certainly we we share the same values with our UK partners, and that's important. I, that that goes back to the the foundation of why we have uh, our intelligence relationship with the UK. We have common interests, and we we share common values. The issue of publicly available information and what the government, uh, specifically the intelligence community, is going to do with it, is the is the key. It's not the fact that it's out there. Uh, because it is out there. It's really uh, the public's, uh, it, it's a public trust issue. Uh, it's, uh, you, you probably give more information, I do, to, to Amazon and Netflix and all, all of those things that, that, that you could imagine, but nobody uh, sort of worries about what they're going to do about it other than you might get spammed in terms of lots of uh, emails. It's the question of not so much the information, it's how it is going to be used. And that is going to be an issue that is always going to be out there. Uh, and it will require an ongoing effort on the part of the government, on the part of senior intelligence officials like the Director of National Intelligence and others going out there saying, hey, this is a uh, repository, a reservoir of useful information that the intelligence community needs to tap into to provide uh, insights and thereby carry out its mission, which is to protect uh, the American people. The one thing I always uh, mention to people when they're concerned about this issue of the intelligence community using publicly available information versus what Amazon does with your information or Google or Apple is the big difference is one of those entities has sworn an oath to preserve and protect the Constitution of the United States and to defend the American people. The other hasn't. So um, this is, again, uh, will require uh, an ongoing uh, communication effort between the intelligence community and the public in order to maintain some level of trust which will allow the intelligence community to carry out its, its uh, lawful mission. Well said. Uh, Smith, I actually have a quick follow-up for you. So, sure. I mean, we've talked about, um, you know, technology transfer and um, this, this idea that, um, you know, we're, we're looking at a future where, where technology alliances are going to be <clears throat> instrumental to success. We see how much money uh, China and other countries are investing in mm -hmm. disruptive capabilities. Um, we, we, on the, we, on our hand, are, are, have at least committed to working with our allies to develop competing technologies in the areas of artificial intelligence and quantum computing and cyber capabilities. What, what are your recommendations for how to communicate sort of the stakes of this? That, you know, this isn't just about technology competition, but there's a values component of as well, that if we coordinate between, you know, like-minded countries to develop these um, disruptive capabilities that have tremendous impact on society, that it's, it's, it's actually an important element for, for our success sort of in this values debate as well about technology. And I've opened up to others as well, but interested in Samantha's comments in particular. Yeah, it's incredibly important. And I think by sharing and working together, we're showing that we all agree with this value, that we're trying to promote this as, as a global view as well, understanding that other nations disagree with that posture. I think, you know, 
what's interesting about what's going on in Ukraine is that Russia's whole goal, Putin's whole goal here, is to drive Ukraine out of interest in NATO, out of interest in the EU. And, and in a sense, he's sort of pushing them, you know, into our arms, so to speak. And same thing with, like, Finland and Sweden taking a look now. And Moldova, considering the EU, um, Switzerland giving up its neutrality and actually saying something, which I think was surprising to a lot of people here, um, it's having that opposite effect. And so we sort of have this moment now where democratic nations are coming together to say, like, these values of openness and transparency and democracy and freedom and liberty and all of these things are, are critical, and people want this. They're, you know, defending their land and their country and these ideals that makes their country so unique to them. And it, the global stage really needs to kind of step up in this area, too, and show that we want to continue to work together here and to spread that message. And part of that is through collaborating and being open and saying, like, you know, we might have had some barriers in place before, but given the threats we're all facing, we're going to be stronger together. And, and to go back to the national technology industrial base, that was a big piece behind it. It's like, look at all these threats we're facing in Russia and in increasing threats from China, where we used to talk about, you know, near peer competitors. And a lot of times now you hear peer competitors, you know, we're getting to this point where we can't say, oh, we have this great technological dominance anymore because of all the investment China's putting in and the investment they're putting into their own industrial base and even directing projects and programs and funneling money into their own sort of version of Silicon Valley, but in a way where they can have the IP rights to your technology and they can control things um, in a way that we don't do in democratic nations. And being able to collaborate on these things is going to get faster results. It's going to get solutions into the hands of our allies. Like, what's the point of developing all of this stuff in silos? And then, oh, well, we have to go through this big, like, FMS congressional approval before we can share this. Or we have to have some, you know, secret agreement to be able to collaborate on one thing, but just for this case, and then we won't do it again. You know, why? Why is that? Mm -hmm. You know, I think it, the reason used to be, well, we're afraid of infiltration from foreign actors, and so we're going to build a lot of really high fences instead of, you know, the building one or two really high fences around a few things and sharing more things, which was kind of the Reagan global view, which, which McCain shared, and I think a lot of people still continue to believe in, and how do we get to that state? You know, is, is this a driving factor? Maybe, but it's, there are also laws that have to change to enable it. We can keep signing as many diplomatic agreements as we want, but this is what happened when the U.S.-U.K. was trying to work through a free trade agreement, and they ran into these problems of, well, this U.S. law actually prohibits me from doing what I agreed with you that I could do. And then, you know, going back and changing and doing all that is so complicated. Like, why don't we do more of this at the beginning and work out the mechanisms to actually have the effort be successful? Otherwise, we're left with all of these agreements that are aspirational and they're they're wonderful they're doing what we want and we can ap applaud and sign agreements and have press conferences and then when it gets to the nuts and bolts everyone's like <laughs> oh but there's this thing that we are gonna have to get congressional approval on and we don't think they'll do it and then you have you know treasury and DOD and state, and how does that work on the Hill? Well, Treasury, you know, is controlled by the Banking Committee, the Financial Services Committee, so they write the laws for CFIUS. Then you have all of DOD is done by the Armed Services Committees, and then you have Foreign Affairs and Foreign Relations write all the laws for the State Department. So you want to change ITAR, DOD has a huge issue, great, go see your friends in Foreign Relations and convince them to do something and cross your fingers that they actually get a bill on the floor, which is also really rare, or try to convince them to let you do something in another committee of jurisdiction. Like, the way our system's set up uh, doesn't always allow for that cross-collaboration. So I guess the point I'm making is that it's, it's a deeper problem and something where we really need everyone mm -hmm. to focus on how do we reach these goals? How do we align things to become more collaborative? Because when you start unpacking the little pieces out of the box, it's, you know, you might as well just turn it over and dump it out because there's so much there to go through. Can I jump on a comment that Samantha made at the beginning in terms of you know, what we're seeing uh, uh, with, with the allies right now is you know, Putin thought that he would exploit these fissures within mm -hmm. the alliance, and it's backfired. Um, 
looked at, at all the examples that Samantha mentioned, a complete, it, it's phenomenal to see. And then you have others, uh, you know, the Scandinavian countries, you know, looking for, for ways to, to, mm -hmm. to cooperate further. Further, You have the, the Germans that have now committed over 2% GDP. Um, and it's not just in Europe, but also think about the Asia Pacific. Um, you have our allies and partners in the region coming and saying, hey, we're going to put more towards our security. Now's the time for us to figure out how do we better um, cooperate on the security front? What capabilities should we be investing in jointly? Um, there is a window here. And I've heard actually a couple of different uh, Department of Defense officials use the term allied by design. Mm -hmm. um, mm. But now with a national security strategy coming out, a national defense strategy coming out, now's really the, that, that window to, to jump on what does allied by design really look like with these allies and partners who want, who are committing more resource, committing more political will, and that mm -hmm. want to do more with us? You know, we need to, 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 frankly, to take advantage of that and figure out what best to do. There. Yeah, extending trust in a meaningful way exactly. that's outside of the, you know, the sort of traditional risk framework management that we've taken to it, which doesn't differentiate between allies and potential threats. And now we see the stakes that are that that cooperation is actually essential, mm -hmm. um, and we need to we need to do it by design. It needs to be baked in. We have a question from the audience. Please step right up. Hi, my name's Kristen Blickert. I'm an attorney here in D.C. Um, I was wondering, with this being the first. Uh, so geographically close major conflict since Brexit. Um, do you think that Britain uh, and the UK figuring out its uh, changed uh, role in the Europe's European Security Alliance um, is going to affect our, our alliance with the UK in any way? And if so, how? I wish we had Ed for, to answer that question, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> yes. It's dangerous for us to speak for the Brits. Uh, but uh, I, I, would, I would say that uh, the relationship uh, between the U.S. and the U.K. is, uh, is so strong, uh, and keeping it on, on, on the theme in terms of the intelligence relationship has always weathered, you know, some political storms, even disagreements uh, between us and our British friends on, on other issues. What we did... <laughs> Certainly, I think, you know, we always looked at the UK as kind of our, our friend within the European Union, you know, uh, and now that they're no longer in the European Union, that sort of visibility and, and that sort of aspect of the US-UK relationship is, is gone. Uh, but I think uh, this issue relative to the Russia-Ukraine war has certainly uh, I think strengthened uh, the Western alliance, certainly. I think, uh, you know, Kerry and, and uh, Samantha have mentioned that uh, a number of times. And certainly within the context of, of NATO and the 30 countries of NATO, uh, the UK uh, plays an incredibly important role. I, I, I served some time at, at, at NATO, and from an intelligence perspective, uh, guess who my closest partner was when I was there? It was my UK uh, counterpart, and that, and that remains. Uh, the same to this day. I, I see that as, as not affected by, by this. There are some interesting pieces to it as well. So one of the issues with the trade treaty was that the UK couldn't agree to certain <clears throat> restrictions on third country or third party transfers of technology that the US was demanding in order to have more open um, transfer of technology and, and perhaps exemptions or carve outs to certain pieces of export mm -hmm. control. And it, they weren't allowed to do it because of their EU commitments there. But now that they don't have those commitments, there is a possible avenue for further negotiation on that front. So um, kind of an interesting mm -hmm. buried piece, but mm -hmm. food for thought. We're short on time, so instead of asking another <laughs> long-winded question, I just want to open up for any, any, cl any closing thoughts from, from the three of you. Anything that, anything that we missed, anything that you think is important to close on? Real quick, uh, the U.S.-U.K. intelligence relationship is so deep and so strong, and as I mentioned in my opening remarks, it really is the model for intelligence cooperation across uh, the board. So when we're looking at uh, more partners, and we need as many partners as we can in this, in this ever-changing uh, global competition, uh, looking and having that, that firm relationship, uh, it's sort of like a 
you know, a safe port in, a, in, a, in stormy seas is, is extremely important. So I think it's absolutely essential that we move forward and we deepen our UK uh, US intelligence relationship because it's it's more and more relevant uh, for today's world. And I'll just leave leave this because we talked a lot about open source. I think the open source and publicly available information uh, realm is an area where I think we should be hand in glove with our, our UK uh, partners in developing the tools and the trade craft and navigating some of the, the legal obstacles. Both of us have certainly uh, different legal frameworks uh, in certain areas. But I think working very closely with our British partners in that area is, uh, I think, is, is critical. Couldn't agree more and just wanted to leave you with, uh, you know, some hope, right? So some great things have happened. We have AUKUS. We have, um, you know, CFIUS had announced that they were going to put on the white list the UK, Canada, and Australia based on the fact <clears throat> that they also have thorough foreign investment review processes. And could you take some of that and maybe apply it to other areas that you look at in, in FOCI, um, in foreign collaboration, um, perhaps? And so there have been some little chipping aways that have occurred. And I think we're on a path to continue looking at this. There was language instructing a, a review on the national technology industrial base implementation. I hope our colleagues at state will uh, collaborate with colleagues at DOD because it's important for both of them to be heavily involved there. But things are, are starting to move in the right direction. Um, and I hope they will continue on that path and just look forward to seeing further collaboration and, and what the allies can really do to, to defeat Putin and his autocratic regime. Yeah, I'll end where I started, which is I am for, I've been fortunate to see really the best of this relationship and, and the depth of the, co with the, the collaboration, the cooperation, the integration, all the things mm -hmm. that Jim talked about. Um, I would recommend, that, God, we got to fix those basic things. It's mm -hmm. the badging, the SCIF <laughs> facility access. I mean, those, those things that shouldn't be hard, but gosh, you fix those, it just makes the rest of it that much easier to do. And there are going to be some hard operational challenges ahead of us. I'll throw out JADC, which is probably a whole nother discussion. But mm -hmm. you, know, you think about a future where you have a satellite collecting data that on, say, a missile launch that has to pass off to a ground radar that's tracking that missile that then has to pass off targeting coordinates to a shooter. It's hard enough for us to do it across services. How do you do that with an ally? How, how does a UK sensor then feed a, a, a US shooter at machine speed without a human in the loop with machine learning? Um, we need to be able to get to that kind of a model, true integration at the operational level. Um, but that's going to require us to go back and fix those, those <laughs> policies, processes, mm -hmm. and, and get the people, mm -hmm. people trained um, to do that mission. Outstanding. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thanks to the audience here, and thanks for everybody tuning in. We'll just give a quick round of applause for our panelists here. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you.